At the bottom of the Mediterranean lies the wreck of a mighty ocean liner, the SS Britannic. She was a sister ship of the Titanic, which went down after striking an iceberg on her maiden voyage in 1912. After that disaster, in which 1,500 people perished, Britannic was built to be much stronger and safer. But in 1916, she sank almost three times faster than her famous sister ship. What had gone so badly wrong? What had sent her to her watery grave? The Britannic lies in the Aegean Sea, thousands of miles from the North Atlantic passenger routes for which she was built. World War I diverted her to the Mediterranean, and she ended up off mainland Greece on the seabed of the Kia Channel. On Kia Island, an expedition is getting ready to solve a mystery that's baffled people since November 21st, 1916, the day Britannic sank. Their mission? To discover how and why she was lost. What we hope to do is find out the exact cause of Britannic's demise and why she sank three times faster than Titanic. Obviously, uh, everybody's familiar with the, with the Titanic. Um, the, the, the Britannic is sort of a, a forgotten sister, really, of the Titanic. She's planned as a, uh, a larger, grander ship. Unfortunately, she never fulfilled that promise. At the beginning of the 20th century, the White Star Line sailed luxury liners across the Atlantic. But after the loss of Titanic, the company had to ensure that her youngest sister, Britannic, would be the final word in safety at sea. Five of the ship's 16 bulkheads were raised to the height of the bridge deck. And a double skin was added to protect Britannic's boiler rooms and engine spaces from an underwater object like an iceberg. The White Star Line official who oversaw all these improvements was Captain Charles Bartlett. His last job as Britannic's captain was to give the order to abandon ship. Britannic was completed just after the outbreak of World War I and was requisitioned by the British government as a hospital ship. Her only passengers were British war wounded from the Mediterranean. And it was in the Aegean rich hunting ground for German U-boats, where Britannic met her fate. Even now, nobody knows whether she was hit by a mine or a torpedo. If it was a torpedo, Britannic sinking was no accident. It was a war crime. The 16 divers and Carl Spencer's team are a mix of full-time professionals and weekend enthusiasts. Their mission will be to penetrate deep inside the wreck to discover why she sank so quickly. Carl also has a three-man sonar survey team. Its mission is to scour the seabed around Britannic for traces of the weapon that sent her to the bottom. But it's a race against time. The Greek government has given the Britannic expedition just 14 days to solve an 87-year-old mystery. Carl is under a lot of pressure, but new diving technology may save the day. On previous expeditions to, to the Britannic, the divers have been using conventional scuba equipment. Because of our mission objectives, we need to spend a lot more time at depth in order to penetrate the hull deeper than ever before. The only way we can do that is by using rebreather technology. The rebreather is a piece of equipment which Carl believes has revolutionized deep sea diving. Okay, that one's okay. It allows divers to stay down longer by recycling the oxygen they breathe. 
Because it uses oxygen far more efficiently, the rebreather is light and compact, making it ideal for exploring inside wrecks. As the expedition's underwater photographers, Carl has chosen Antonello Paoni, a policeman from Rome, Italy, and Lee Bishop, a firefighter from Stevenage, England. We're looking for parts of shipwrecks that people can identify, relate to. Um, they're the kind of images that we're setting up and looking for. I want to take photographs which will show the people who can never dive this wreck the beauty and the majesty of the Britannic. So tomorrow you guys are going to take down the steel test lab. Canadian microbiologist Laurie Johnston wants to study a natural phenomenon she has already observed during two dives on Titanic. The ability of live bacteria to consume steel. I'd like to be able to compare uh, the types of deterioration on Britannic with Titanic itself. Can you explain what, what it is we We've designed a number of experiments to look at the types of bacteria that are down there and how aggressive they are, which will help us to measure the rates of deterioration on these ships. All these ships were made of steel, so these types of bacteria actually take out the elements within the steel. I know the structure and just the sheer size of it. I'd give my left arm to be able to touch it, to see it with my own eyes. After a busy day of preparation, the expedition is ready. I think we should start off with a big hand to Carl for getting us all here in the first place. The mount, the mount, mount of hassle he's gone. Geraint Falks Jones, okay. whom Carl has chosen to organize the diving, chairs a final pre dive briefing. Major detail, because we'd still be here First item on Geraint's agenda the job of attaching a diving line to the Britannic, known as shotting the wreck. This task is handed over to the Loyal Watch's skipper, Steve Wright. The first shot he's going to deploy is going to be the one primarily for anchoring the watcher up on. And the second shot will be the one that uh, Rick and Zaid go down and uh, will tie in. Now, the second shot, will that have a length of chain on the bottom of it? It will have a length of chain. So once we've got the, uh, the shot in, we'll have to get the first pair in. We're going to be using the standard yellow orange marker, OK? So that an orange marker says you're on, the, you're on the wreck and it's all tied in. You know, if there's a definite problem, we definitely need to be shot it. Right, um, we'll send the yellow marker up, OK? Uh, Simon's book has got a colour photograph of the wreck. The expedition's historical advisor is Simon Mills. Um, watch out for split sinks with the rivets um, and the steel sinks. Britannic was supposed to be the answer to all the questions of why the Titanic sank. Titanic lasted four and a half days. Britannic lasted less than a year in service. So there's a lot of questions there. Why did she sink quite so quickly? We've made some giant steps over the last few years to sort of answer those questions, but we can sort of do even more here now. In many respects, it's probably the most detailed survey that we've ever done. It's 9 a.m., and the adventure begins as the Loyal Watcher heads out towards the busy Kia Channel. The Loyal Watcher is just a shade under 24 metres long, and she's about 110 tonnes. So she's, as a small boat goes, she's very solid, very well built, and I'm pleased to say that she stands out on a radar image like a very big ship. So anything that's approaching us, we'll know that we're there. It's interesting that most of the tugboats that used to move the Britannic around would have been bigger than this boat. We are quite small in the grand scale of things, but we don't mind. We hold our ground quite nicely. Yeah, can ask for Just 20 minutes after leaving Kia, Loyal Watcher's echo sounder locates Britannic on the seabed. You're getting excited. Oh, very much so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good effort. You can see as the top section is all solid and then inside basically it's hollow. So the sound is telling me that we're still running over the wreck. Is the Kia Channel about to give up her secrets at last? Yeah. Wow, I better go and get ready. She's really excited. <laughs> The first job is for Gordon, a loyal watcher crewman 
to drop a 400-foot-long line to Britannic. It's called shotting the wreck. Then Gordon begins the first stage in setting up a decompression station that extends 130 feet underwater. This is vital to the diver's safety. At 400 feet, they are diving at the extreme limit of human endurance. If they return to the surface too quickly, they can get the bends, which can cause a painful death. In charge of the first day's diving is satellite software designer Geraint Fawkes Jones. I basically sort of coordinate all the various jobs, make sure that certain things happen at certain times, make sure that uh, when people have gone into the water, they're logged. If anything goes wrong, allocate jobs to sort out the problem that occurs and make sure that everybody gets out safely. So there's a whole team of people making it happen, but as dive marshal, it's my job to coordinate that team. As the morning sun hits 80 degrees Fahrenheit, the divers in their dry suits are getting uncomfortable. Thank you. <laughs> First into the water will be Manchester firefighter Rick Waring and Zaid al a professional diver born in Iraq and now a British citizen. They have to secure the shot line to the wreck. Another team of divers will explore Britannic's forward section to photograph and video the state of the wreck. They will also play some of Laurie Johnston's experiments on the superstructure. With the shot line as their guide, the diver's 400-foot journey to the wreck takes no more than three minutes. The shot line has been fastened to a mooring bollard in the jagged break in Britannic's bow. When she plunged onto the seabed, the bow was virtually severed from the rest of the ship. What caused that fatal wound? A torpedo fired from a German U-boat? Or a floating mine? Whatever it was, people on board Britannic were caught completely by surprise. Portholes left open to ventilate the cabins helped her to sink in just 55 minutes. The underwater camera reveals one of the ship's 10 big lifeboat cranes. The huge loss of life on Titanic was blamed on the fact that she had lifeboats for less than half of the 2,200 people on board. Learning from that disaster, Britannic had 44 lifeboats, more than enough for the 1,100 people on the ship. A Laurie Johnston experiment to measure microbacterial activity is carefully placed on the boat deck next to the officer's quarters. On the bridge, a diver examines one of four big brass engine telegraphs used to ring down orders to the engine room. From this bridge, Captain Charles Bartlett skippered the 48,000-ton ship. Simon Mills bought the wreck of Britannic in 1996 and has become the world's leading expert on the ship and her captain. Charles Bartlett was one of the more experienced White Star skippers. Very romantic story, ran away to sea at the age of 12. He'd been with the company for 22 odd years. He'd risen to command one of their largest liners. 1912, he became the White Star Marine Superintendent at Liverpool, and it meant that he actually was involved in a great deal of the improvements that were made on Britannic. Charles Bartlett is um, a very strange character in one respect, because he is one of the few captains who probably saw his ship built, launched, and sink underneath him. There are very few captains who can claim that's a dubious distinction. 
The divers have spent only 30 minutes on Bartlett's ship, but five long, weary hours at the underwater decompression station. Hey, oh, thanks. Good film stuff. Excellent. Have a good try, mate. Thanks, everybody. The dive support team makes sure all their heavy gear, spare oxygen tanks, underwater scooters and cameras, are safely returned to Loyal Watcher. One by one, the divers reappear, exhausted, thirsty, but impressed by what they've seen far below. Oh, bloody hell, it's big. It's huge, absolutely huge. It is massive, yeah. Okay. It's impressive. Yeah. I've never seen anything like that. She looks like a cake made of layers, one on top of the other. And they, those are the decks, the different decks. And uh, lots of marine life on it. Okay. Um, How about that, Zaydi? It's really brilliant. Is that blue? Really, really good. Well, this is the biggest, definitely. It definitely is the biggest. It's huge! <laughs> Christina Campbell, one of the expedition's two women divers, is the last out of the water. Okay, Christina, come through. Right. Christina a nice sort of bit of tissue. You had a good dive then? Yeah, we had quite a good dive. Yeah. How did you find it in general? Um, well, it was in the, the place where the shot was supposed to be, which was um, in the break, basically. They tied it onto a couple of bollards. And we went to um, drop the experiments off. Do you think you'll be able to look at the experiments again? Yeah, they, of course I will. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get the experiments back, don't we? Yeah, it should be all right. I'm just a bit tired. Do you want a drink? Yeah, please. What do you want? Just a cup of tea. A cup of tea. A cup of tea. English tea. The next day, Carl hopes to send divers deep inside Britannic. He believes that the answer to the mystery of her sinking lies in a section known as the Fireman's Passage. But the old lady will not give up her secrets without a struggle. Overnight, stormy weather has whipped up the waters in the Kia Channel canceling the day's diving. To be blown out by the weather, it's not unusual. I mean, if I've dived everything I planned, then I'll be doing a lot of diving each year, but it never happens that way, and I think you have to be used to that with diving. Some divers find ways of letting off steam. It's also a, a period of time when we have the chance to meet each other a bit better to relax, to uh, form the group in a uh, better way. And so I think it's great. We are in a beautiful eye, a beautiful place. Graham, can you give us a scratch test, please? Court chart, Bill Smith's court chart. sonar survey team uses the bad weather to check and test its most important item of yeah, equipment, that's that, that's a lie, this torpedo-shaped device. It's a state-of-the-art sideways sonar probe that can detect even the smallest objects on the seabed. Yeah, that's good. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we've got the that. Germans were said to have laid sea mines in the Kia Channel around the time Britannic sank. If the rumor is true, Bill is optimistic that he and his team will be able to locate the evidence. The first object is to get the best quality sonar image we can get of the wreck. This is a bit like setting up a, a, a very good photograph. So that's the first thing we're going to do, which will allow us to calibrate the equipment, make sure it's doing everything it should do. The problem we've got is that we have a 900 foot long wreck um, and visibility on the bottom of the ocean is maybe 10 meters. Flying the fish in a steady pattern, in a straight line, past the ship, absolutely even and absolutely straight, is what's going to give us the, um, the best possible images of the wreck. The second objective is to go after the minefield um, through which it's supposed Britannic sailed and hopefully find evidence of the mines, the mine cradles, possibly some wreckage that was blown out of the ship. And these are very small targets, very, very small targets indeed. So by doing a little bit of practice on the wreck, we can get a lot of information that will make it easier to find these very small targets later on.
There are three more days of rough seas, and the expedition is beginning to fall dangerously behind schedule. We're going to have to accelerate the program, and we're going to have to really push these guys to the limit. They're, they're, they're already pushing the, the equipment they've got as far as they dare, but we're going to have to really burn these rebreathers. We're going to have to use them to their maximum potential. We've got mission objectives to do. All the guys understand that, so if we're going to push the envelope that little bit more, then I've got the guys here that are prepared to do that. By the next day, the strong winds have disappeared. The A flag, the international signal for divers in the water, is raised over Loyal Watcher. To make up for lost time, Carl sends 10 divers down onto Britannic instead of the usual six. And he makes his first dive on the wreck by exploring the interior of the officer's quarters. We dive a lot of shipwrecks around the UK, and, and the majority of them are from wartime, and they've either been torpedoed or destroyed by bombers, and so they're in a fairly poor condition, really. And to penetrate the wreck is dangerous, but Britannic is in such good condition that you feel confident in penetrating the wreck and swimming around in passageways. Lee Bishop photographs the running light on the port bridge wing. If you could ever choose one dive to do in your life, it's got to be Britannic. It's the most special shipwreck in the world. This wreck is uh, fantastic in its own right simply because the sheer size of it. Yeah, it's awesome on the seabed there. Teresa Tellis, the expedition's other female diver, explores the crew's quarters beyond the massive break in the bow. Although the equipment is very heavy, once you're in the water, you're absolutely neutrally buoyed. But you have a lovely three-dimensional feel. You feel that you can go anywhere. You can glide in and out of places and go wherever you choose, so it's very like flying. Inside the crew's quarters, Teresa and her partner Kevin Pickering find a spiral staircase that leads deep inside the wreck. It's too dangerous to go any further. Behind the bridge, they discover the captain's bath with the plug still in it. Unlike Titanic, there are few traces of luxury, just medicine cabinets and some of the 3,000 hospital beds on board. In her 11 months at sea, Britannic never carried a single fair-paying passenger, only wounded soldiers from the Mediterranean. Near the staircase intended for first-class passengers, a drinking fountain. Inside the radio room, a Marconi wireless set, last used to send SOS calls as the ship began to sink. At the end of their half hour on the wreck, the divers begin the slow and dangerous ascent towards the decompression station. A deep support diver releases the balloon that informs Loyal Watcher that all divers are off the wreck. Supervised by the support team, the wreck divers ascend in slow, carefully timed stages.
Before they return to the surface, they need to offload all the excess nitrogen and helium inside their bodies or risk the bends. When they pressurized tunnels in the 1800s, and tunnel workers would have been under 10 meters pressure during the entire work shift. It turned out, as they come up, just like when you open up a bottle of Coca-Cola, the bubbles were fizzing up and these bubbles were then collecting in their elbows and consequently bending their elbows. There has been occasions in my diving career when I've been very conscious that I'm possibly heading for a bend and it's not a nice feeling, to be perfectly honest. There are days when maybe the equipment's uncomfortable, or your back hurts, or it's cold, or you're being bounced around, that you don't want to do the decompression, but I would say 90% of the time I have absolutely no problem with it making sure you're doing a slow ascent and doing your stops as you require. I replay the dive to myself because what that again does is helps me remember my dive. It's the last few feet below the surface that are the most dangerous. The divers should have cleared their bodies of nitrogen and helium. Now it's a buildup of oxygen that can kill. Expedition leader Carl Spencer is first back on board. Sit you down there, Carl. So, Carl, what's it like to be back diving again? Oh, it's absolutely awesome, that is. It's a fantastic wreck. It's absolutely massive. What do you think of that then? Oh, it was stunning. I was just saying how fantastic it was. Oh, so it's just so much bigger than anything else we've dived. It's a lot, it's a lot prettier than Titanic. Um, Wait, what do you mean by that? Well, a Titanic's a lot. It's, it's quite, it's quite dark down there, and uh, you know, and it looks kind of ghostly with all the rusticles and stuff on it. But 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 Britannic, it, it's it's a lot. It's alive. It's, it's teeming, absolutely teeming. Yeah, um, shell, shells of fish all over it, which which again is completely different uh, to Titanic. It's just. It's just a completely different feeling. I mean, it's essentially the same wreck, but um, so, so different. One of the divers returns with some exciting news. He may have found a way into the fireman's tunnel. I think what I found is a tunnel um, in the break. It's, it's right just where the keel is. Right. Right at the very bottom. It's about 100, and, it's the entrance about 100 and 203 metres. Um, so I've tied my line off there. I've gone in, I would say, no more than 10 metres, and what there is is like a checkered floor plate right. with a handrail. So I swam down there, put a line in as I went, and then it just came to the first set of uh, boilers, where the boiler room was. Definitely warrants further uh, further investigation in yeah. that particular area. I mean, it, it, it looks like that little fireman's tunnel that's on the, uh, on the plans. It right. does look like it, but uh, whether it is or not, I don't really know, mate. We'll okay. see. Meanwhile, from a hired Greek fishing boat, Bill Smith's sonar survey team is making good progress. Take it from there. Okay. You are it? Oh. Just let that go. Right. Yeah, I've got it. Are you ready on the winch? Yeah, ready. Yeah, it gives a little bit of cable. Okay, it's flying. Bill's first task is to get clear sonar images of Britannic. Look at that crumpled section, the damage on the front of the bow. That is just magnificent. And there's the forward deck with the cranes on and the front of the superstructure. Oh, we can even see the anchor crane this time. Oh, fantastic. Look and there's that. the foremast bent over at the top. The crow's nest halfway up. It's a bit stretched because we're traveling very slowly. There's the split in the side. That's a magnificent shot when that's cleaned up. Back on Loyal Watcher, news filters through that one of the divers is struggling to make it safely to the surface. Lee hasn't surfaced yet, although he said he was going to come up and the support diver said he was going to come up and theoretically he's finished all his stops. 
So what we imagine is that he's got a slight niggle, perhaps in his elbow or shoulder or knee or something like that, which is affecting him just below the surface. So he's decided to obviously stay under at three metres for a little while longer. After spending six hours in the water, Lee makes a difficult return. He has a mild case of the bends. Where is it in your leg? Oh, it's the normal niggle, you know. Well, I've broken broke my leg a couple of times in the past. And yeah, same old spot, you know. The expedition's paramedic, Neil Plant, supplies Lee with pure oxygen to eliminate the nitrogen bubbles inside his leg. Hey, I'll lift your up as your hood then. Okay. Did you want your off off film? No, not really. Oh, he'll be all right. It's nothing that hasn't happened to him before, or to most of the rest of us, to be perfectly honest. With excellent weather, the expedition quickly makes up for lost time. This is a very busy sea lane. You can see now you've got some quite large tankers moving up and down. What I'm kind of hoping is that part of the agreement with the license is that there's a one mile exclusion zone around the wreck site. So I'm hoping that if these ships are abiding by the rules, they should be giving us at least a mile clearance. The draft on some of these ships is you know, 10, 15 metres. So you have a group of divers all doing the decompression stops in six metres, you've got quite a serious problem, so it is, it does take a bit of concentration. During each eight-hour dive, Loyal Watcher maintains her vigil inside the one-mile exclusion zone. But not every ship's master is willing to respect it. Just stand ready on the other side now. One freighter ignores Loyal Watcher's persistent efforts to warn her off. Huge and threatening, the ship passes within 230 feet of the divers at their decompression stops. They have had a very narrow escape. It kind of makes you feel almost sick. You think, I've got to get out of here. You know, really, really. In November 1916, the Mediterranean had become a deadly place for ships like Britannic. This film, shot from a marauding German U-boat, shows how Allied merchant shipping became easy prey. to the end of his life, Captain Bartlett was convinced his ship had been torpedoed. British naval intelligence knew that a German submarine, the U-73, had been operating in the Kia Channel near the time Britannic was sunk. However, the U-boat was not a conventional type armed with torpedoes, but a mine layer. Only three weeks before Britannic made its final voyage, U-73 had laid 12 mines off Kia Island. Was it a mine like this that Britannic blundered into? Bill Smith is convinced he's close to finding out. That's a big piece of something. Not the best image of it I've seen, but it's a big piece of something. Nearly. 50 meters in slant range. But look, there's bits everywhere. There's some more up there, there's a bit there, there's a bit there. There's just a scattering, an isolated debris field, but it's quite big. But Bill is on a false trail. In fact, all that he has found are the remains of two of Britannic's four funnels. He has to start again. Rich Stevenson begins his second mission into number six boiler room, this time with an underwater video camera. He starts his dangerous journey deep inside the yawning gap in Britannic's bow. Following the Titanic disaster in 1912, the ship's builders redesigned this part of Britannic. They raised five of the 16 bulkheads including the one just in front of number six boiler room, 
and went on to add a double hull. Ironically, the man responsible for supervising all these improvements for the White Star Line was Britannic skipper on the day she sank. Well, here we are in the Keir Channel. It's now half past nine in the morning. And I, I would imagine that what we're looking at now is pretty much what Captain Bartlett would have been looking at on the morning of 21st of November 1916. Reasonably calm conditions, nice blue sky, very, very warm. The normal procedure was when the uh, ship came into areas where they knew there were U-boats, they would automatically swing out the boats and close the watertight doors so that in the event of a tank, the ship was as prepared as possible. As far as the Britannic was concerned, the boats may not have been swung out, but the standard operating procedure would have had those watertight doors closed. Now, of course, every ship operates in a four-hour watch system, so at some times of the day, those doors have to be open to allow the crews to, to transfer from one boiler room to the other. Uh, and, of course, at 8 o'clock in that morning, the doors would have been open to, to change the watch. At breakfast time on November 21st, 1916, Britannic was shaken by an underwater explosion. Immediately, the ship took on thousands of tons of seawater. With the new bulkhead design, she should have been able to withstand the massive flooding. But she sank in just 55 minutes. Why? Rich Stevenson goes in search of the answer, into a place no human has seen since the day Britannic sank. He has to feel his way through narrow spaces deep inside the wreck in order to get at the truth. As he makes his way along the fireman's passage and into the forward number six boiler room, his video footage reveals that the two watertight doors there are surprisingly still in the open position. concentrating on making sure the camera doesn't shake and I'm making sure that the rebreather's still firing and I'm just making sure that I know where I am and I don't give a f what kind of door it is. I think for me the single most important piece of videotape has got to be the footage inside that boiler room, the open watertight doors. Everyone knew to a certain extent they were open but uh, even I was quite surprised to find out just how widely open they were. Had that door closed, Britannic would have survived. It's as simple as that. How did it happen? Did the huge force from the underwater explosion jam the doors in the open position? Or did the men in number six boiler room flee in blind panic instead of staying and closing them? In the final days of the Britannic 2003 expedition, the divers have only one part of the ocean giant left to explore, her massive stern. Here, with the 23-foot blades of the port side propeller looming above them, they sense an altogether different atmosphere. I'm sitting on the rudder with my tripod. I'm looking through the viewfinder, and I'm seeing these awesome props that uh, I've never seen in my life before, as big as that. Captain Bartlett wanted to save Britannic by running her onto Kia Island just two and a half miles away. But many of the 1,100 people on board wanted to quit the stricken vessel as quickly as possible. Without waiting for orders from the bridge to abandon ship, they lowered lifeboats while Britannic was still moving. 
two lifeboats were inexorably drawn towards the whirling blades of the port side propeller. In one of the boats was Violet Jessup, a ship stewardess who had by an amazing coincidence survived the Titanic disaster four years earlier. She later wrote, A few minutes after the lifeboat first touched the water, every man in the group of surrounding boats took a flying leap into the sea. It was extraordinary to find myself in the space of a few minutes the only occupant of the boat. I turned around to see the reason for this exodus and to my horror saw Britannic's huge propellers churning and mincing everything near them. Men, boats and everything were just one ghastly whirl. This propeller claimed the lives of no less than 30 people. Dozens more, including Violet Jessup, were seriously injured. But everybody else on board escaped unharmed. Despite the Greek authorities' 14-day deadline, Carl Spencer's team has discovered why Britannic sank three times faster than her sister ship, Titanic. And, with the help of an old German Navy logbook, Bill Smith believes he knows what sent her to the bottom. Uh, and then we'll be about ready to call it a wrap as well. Bill, in the limited time that he's had, has already located the minefield. And um, it's exactly where the German commander said um, he had deployed the minefield, which is, uh, you know, typically German. So we're fairly certain that we're going to conclusively prove the reason Britannic sank was she hit a mine. We've searched out the given positions for the German minefields uh, from the, the chart that was recorded at the time. And it's the only place we've seen any debris anywhere on the seabed. And better than that, we found a perfect line of evenly spaced small targets precisely through the center of the minefield. Back on land, Bill analyzes the data for an area of seabed less than a mile from the wreck of Britannic. Right in the very center of the position given for the inshore minefield, we suddenly get these objects. This one here. Then there's another one, exactly the same. There's a third one down there. And what we have a little bit further down, there's a small round object here, what appears to be like a broken open piece of eggshell. There's the back half of the eggshell. That looks very, very much like a smashed open, like a smashed open mine lying on the bottom. If we go a little bit higher up, we've got a complete egg, completely closed up and just lying there in the sand. And on this top one, you can actually see its little arms that once grasped the mine before it was dropped. Carl Spencer's team has succeeded in solving the mystery of Britannic. The divers have found the open watertight doors that made her sink in 55 minutes. And Bill Smith's sonar team has proved Britannic struck a mine laid by the German submarine U-73 under the command of this man. Captain Lieutenant Gustav Cease. Cease later said, Minds do not choose. We submarine commanders sometimes had infamy thrust upon us for the work they did. But the result of his October 1916 patrol into the Aegean has given divers and scientists the chance to explore this magnificent White Star Liner. Preliminary results from Laurie Johnston's experiments show that the warmth and natural light of the Kia Channel have protected Britannic from the microorganisms that have turned her famous sister ship, Titanic, into a mass of rusticles. Britannic at this stage is a lot less deteriorated than Titanic because a lot of the organisms on there are not degrading the steel. They're looking for a surface to attach to, whereas Titanic 
the breasticles are the dominant organism and they're continuously removing the elements out of the steel. Britannic's elder sister shows all the signs of advanced decay. Titanic has suffered as a result of the rusticles. Britannic is in better shape simply because the rusticles are not the dominant organism. Even though they're extremely aggressive, they are taking time and breaking it down. Okay, that's everybody aboard now. Right, we can drop the A flag. The Britannic 2003 expedition heads back to Kia Island for the last time. I'm extremely proud of the team. I'm extremely proud of what we've achieved. By using rebreathers, it's allowed us to access parts of the Britannic previously inaccessible. Just, um... By getting into that fireman's tunnel and getting into the boiler room, we've been able to prove why the Britannic sank three times faster than Titanic, despite the safety modifications following the Titanic disaster. The results speak for themselves, really. Britannic lived her short life in the shadow of her sister, Titanic. But for Carl's underwater explorers, she has engendered a sense of mystery, fascination, and awe that is entirely her own. 